Yeah, I'm Martin Brown. I'm the, the chairman of Tees Cottage Pumping Station. I've been for the, the last year, year and a half-ish. So welcome everybody to this, the 175th anniversary of the, the founding the founding of this uh, of the place. Um, yeah, it goes back to 1849. I thought I had the date was June the um, June the, the 30th, 1849, but Chris Lloyd from the North Mecca here has got some other dates as well. So I'm just going to settle for late June 1849. <laughs> Maybe Chris will uh, Chris will correct it as we go along. Um, so yeah, 1849, somewhere up towards Bushel Hill Reservoir. Those of you from Darlington will know where Mowden Primary and Junior School is. That was where Bushel Hill Reservoir was, certainly when I was a lad back in the, uh, many, many moons ago, we used to play in that reservoir and I think it shut down in the, in the 70s. But that was, turns out, to be about the highest spot in Darlington from, from which water could drain by gravity to the high row where Henry Pease and his chums all lived, so they had some clean water. As well as, um, sorry, Yes, as so well as been a celebration of the place being, been built. Uh, I think we should also remember that it was a huge turning point for the, the, um, the health of the population of Darlington initially, and then later, not far later, a few years later, the population of Middlesbrough, Stockton, and Yarm, getting clean water, saving people from drinking the dirty stuff out of the, out of the skirn or out of the polluted ground wells in the town was a huge step, a huge step forward. And uh, yeah, it's been it's been proven for so many years, from 1849 till 1926, the, the latest development on the site when they installed the, the electric pumps. So we're near a lot, a lot of a lot of years. Um, we're quite successful at the moment. Uh, we have on a Wednesday we have maybe 25 to 30 um, volunteers working on the site. Uh, on open days we have to have about 40 people on the site to get them open so we are quite a big investor in the local community and I think when we had the, uh, the Darlington Cares uh, team here they, they, they told us that we're probably the biggest volunteer, the volu volunteering organisation in the area I think we calculate about 12,000 volunteer hours a year which is really quite a lot for a for an organize, organization. In addition to that sort of community support, we've really, we've really moved forward in recent times with our education program. And for example, this year, by the middle of July, we'll have had 400 students, children and students, through our gates to, uh, to uh, participate in our educational program. And they represent seven or eight, not well, seven, it's eight schools in the local area, Darlington, Thornaby, uh, Billingham and Hartlepool have been here this year, so that's another uh, a great community aspect of our, uh, of our work. And again, we're doing well, but all things aren't maybe as rosy as they might be. We, we're all getting older and older, and the, the average age of the, the, the volunteering team must be much closer to a start, much closer to a seven and a six probably I, I, would, I would guess there are some exceptions but there's some exceptions on the high side as well um i'm gonna say yeah so yeah the age of our volunteers that's that's an issue for the future but also the cost of things and uh, we only we bought a ton of ton of polish steam coal last week the cost of 620 odd pounds for the ton Whereas three years ago we were buying much, much better quality coal for 230, 240 pounds a ton. So with the cost of the cost of coal going up by a factor of almost three, that's quite a challenge, quite a challenge for the future. Um, so today it's primarily a thank you to all of those, all of you who are members, all of you who support us in one way or another, to say thank you for your contribution, your support over the over the years, and we just hope hope that it uh, it continues for much longer. I'd just like to say a word about our, our guests today. Um, one was Paulina, but I don't think she's here yet. But I think it's Jeff from Cummins. But Cummins provide us with with volunteers every month, which is really really much much appreciated. Um, and then we have Lee Holwood from Northumbrian Water. 
Lee spends a significant part of his budget on keeping this place looking, looking pristine. And we'd like to take another important share of his budget whenever we, whenever we can. Okay. I knew I was here for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> you told me <laughs> another important person is sitting on the sink of Subway, sitting over there. When we have our open days, he provides us with all sorts of refreshments and food from his his fine restaurants establishment. So thanks Sitnam for all you do for us. Thank you. I'd hoped we'd have somebody here from um, a River Tees, a Tees River Trust, but uh, but um, what's she called? She's what's she called? Jackie. Jackie. Jackie Schmidt is on holiday at the moment, so just like to call out to them. They they, pro <coughs> they provide a huge help in our educational offering, bringing samples from the river, educating the kids, and also bringing kids here. We've got Keith Bell from our sister plant at uh, Ryup. He's stood over there, so he's a kindred spirit of ours. And Andrew from the, uh, the Railway Society, who's again another very important part of our, our, our open days. I'd also like to introduce Steve, Steve Harker, the leader of Darlington Borough Council, who's going to say a, a few words. Uh, we're, we're developing, and uh, this year in particular, I've been developing a closer relationship with DBC. We've, uh, we're now associate members of the Darlington Cares, Darlington Cares Group, and we've had a number of uh, Stephen's colleagues here, here this year. And now, Dr. Chris Lloyd from the Northern Echo, who Chris is a great supporter of ours. He's, published a number of a number of um, articles in the Echo. We had one in the Darlington Stockton Times yesterday, about last weekend, and he's kindly written a, an article in today's memory section, so thanks for doing that, Chris. Yeah, so this guy from Northumbrian Water was going to say a few words, but and Lee, Lee's suddenly lost his voice, so I know he doesn't want to say it. <laughs> 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 so if he turns up, we we'll let let him speak. But I'd like to ask Steve Harker if you'd say a few words first. Thank you, Martin, for those uh, kind words of introduction. Really, I just wanted to say um, a few words of thanks myself, and also just to reflect on how I see this site and the benefits that it brings um, to Darlington. I think in the email to me, Martin, you said that this wasn't going to be a grand event, and I think miss, missing a trick here, 175 years or however long it is, is something to be to have a grand event about. So it, it is a, a significant amount of time. Possibly when Chris comes along, you might correct it, we might find it's uh, only 174 years, yeah. but nonetheless, <laughs> it is a long time. Um, when I was thinking about this early today, there were the two real benefits, I think, that, that you and this site brings um, to Darlington. Clearly the site itself is magnificent. Um, it reflects a very old technology, but at the time it had been cutting edge technology that was innovative and did many, many beneficial things to Darlington. It helped Darlington go as a town. It brought fresh water here, and Martin was just explaining similarly to Middlesbrough. So at the time, um, it really was um, state-of-the-art technology. And I think the value in that, in, in restoring it and keeping it going, is helpful for us to understand some of our um, heritage, particularly our uh, um, historical heritage about how Darlington as a place came about. It's important that we retain those memories. But also some of the technologies here, I think it's important that we don't forget um, uh, how they work. Secondly, it, I think it, it, it just another thing which is hugely important, and Martin touched on this in terms of his reference to Darlington Cares and the number of people that come here to volunteer. Um, and you made the joke about a lot of your volunteers, their age begins with a, with a seven. I think that's actually very good because it means that, you know, when we retire, and I'm not sure if I'm retired or redundant, we have lots of spare time on our hands and we run the risk of sort of winding down and letting our brains rot. I think places such as this provide opportunities for people that have, you know, long skills from work to come and still use those skills, keep their minds active, keep their bodies active and provides a useful outlet for what is suddenly a huge amount of spare time that, that one suddenly finds um, that you have on your hands. It, I did think then think there's actually a third benefit, um, looking slightly more humorously, 
um, life post retirement I think is often troublesome at home um, with our dearly loved ones that we married or whatever many years ago we suddenly find that we have an awful lot of time together that we weren't used to for many many years and I think at times we are grateful that our other halves do find activities that take them away from home that gives them something meaningful so I think there's also benefits there and I make a humorous point about it but I do think it, it does help with, with it not just what the work that is done here but home life um, as well. Um, Martin touched on this, the pile of coal at the back, and one of the things I was going to reflect on at the end was I think the site itself is important for all the heritage, but I think, you know, what is it that, that is most important here? And clearly it is always the people, it's the skills that you um, bring to this site. But Martin has told me at least on two occasions about the value of the comb at the back. So I'm not clear in Martin's mind whether he values you as the volunteers or his pile of coal that's hidden away at the back. Because he has stressed me on many occasions uh, the price of coal. But I'm pretty certain from my mind it is actually yourselves that do so much work here. And I, I see the benefits not only preserving this site, but it also adds an attraction to Darlington for visitors within Darlington to come and visit but also for people from outside the town. It gives them yet another reason to, to come and visit Darlington, which is the leader of the council, um, is something that I would always encourage. So finally for me, thank you to everyone here and those that are not, not here for all the work you've done keeping this site um, going and working as it is today. So thank you for me. Thanks, We've been walking out already. <laughs> a few years ago, there was a battle of the bookshops in Darlington. You may remember uh, Otikas was it in the Corn Mill Centre, and uh, Waterstones opened in the old dressers um, shop. And um, when those two bookshops opened, uh, Otikas got me to come down to the Corn Mill Centre to sign copies of my new local history book. But Waterstones blew Otikas out of the market by getting a the. Um, the uh, getting the gruffalo to come down and a 20 foot model gruffalo wandering along high road with turned up toes and terrible warts on the end of its nose and there were billions of school children following the gruffalo around buying copies of its book and I was sat on the other side of the road selling nothing overshadowed by a blooming gruffalo um, and so I'm used to being overshadowed but I've never been overshadowed by tiny frogs tiny frogs are far more interesting than anything that I have got to say um, so, exactly 175 years ago on Thursday, I think Thursday just gone, June the 27th, 1849, uh, the first sod was turned to start the construction of the works that was going to bring clean water to Darlington and then to the rest of the Tees Valley. Um, the Durham County Advertiser bubbled over with excitement. It said, Henry Pease Esquire was the chosen man to strip his coat off and handle the spade. And he did handle it in a most artistic and satisfactory manner. A short address on the benefits hoped from the greater diffusion of the universal cleanser flowed from his lips. Loud hussars succeeded and then diverse of the company became infected with the digging furore. And in the most amiable mood, they returned from sod lifting and pipe admiring. And this late latter, not without good reason, for the casting of the pipes is most beautiful. They returned to a substantial and excellent dinner at the King's Head. So you're clearly following in that tradition with your um, substantial and excellent array of cakes. So newspapers across the North carried short reports of the occasion, but they don't give precise details of where that first sod was turned, but I think it was up at what is now Bush Hill Park, up at Malden, the highest point in the town. And that makes sense, that was where the reservoir was until 1971, and the water was pumped from here up to the highest point, and from there it trickled down into the town centre. So, Henry Pease was the managing director of the new Darlington Gas and Water Company. His brother John was the chairman, and his other brother, Joseph, who stands on his statue in High Row, he was the principal shareholder. And it was largely Pease money that set up the company here. And Quakers across Britain were investing at that time in water. It was a good, clean thing to do. So Henry's short address on that first sod-cutting day 
probably included a mention of the new scientific evidence that suggested that diseases like cholera were waterborne. Now, in Darlington, before it got this supply of water, there were 1,470 houses which got their water from 19 public wells sunk into the ground in the town centre. Now, in those days, livestock, livestock, cattle and pigs and that sort of thing milled incontinently around the town centre, um, adding their unwanted contributions uh, from above to the water supply, um, whilst down below, the rough-lined wells allowed water to leach in from the surrounding soil. Um, in Skinnergate, the Skinnergate well, for example, was distressingly close to the burial ground of the Friends Meeting House. So you had water with, uh, with dung on the top, and you had water with uh, human bits and pieces um, flowing in from the bottom. Um, so some people didn't use the wells, um, they had water butts which collected rainwater um, for them to drink. Uh, but in 1851, um, a doctor has supervised the emptying of a water butt in a yard in Bondgate near the Tap and Spile pub and he found at the bottom of the water butt the body of a decomposing baby. Uh, he reckoned the uh, inhabitants of the yard had been drinking water filtered through this decomposing body for at least six months. So um, that's the standard of sanitary arrangements that this um, building and company uh, was set up to address and clearly the new Teeswater was going to be much cleaner than anything in the town centre. So the first water arrived from the pump here into the town centre on April the 24th, 1850, uh, when Edward Pease, the father of the railways, Henry's father, he wrote in his diary, there was considerable stir in Darlington today, this being the first day water was brought into the town from the new water works. But it was controversial. The water was said to have the colour of India Pale Ale and a slight whiff of the pond. And its arrival created a sceptical stir. Old farmers knew that cows that grazed along the banks of the River Tees suffered from diseased lungs and became bellond, as they said, which seems to mean their lungs became congested and short-winded. Um, so the cattle were suffering, and old anglers on the River Tees knew that the fish in the river um, were poisoned by lead that came out of the mines in the dale. Um, so it was feared that humans who drank the pitty coloured water would themselves be poisoned. And one doommonger in Darlow said, The gush of melody will no more be heard from the sweet voices of men, and they will, like the fish, turn upon their backs and perish with uplifted and distorted eyes just by drinking your water <coughs> but the first 230 subscribers to the water didn't end up on their backs with distorted eyes in fact they reported back that the water made the beer better and the tea stronger and of course everybody rushed out to get a subscription far better than a dubious liquid raised from the polluted wells in the town centre now, this brings me to one of my many fascinations about the history of Darlington at this time. There are so many fascinating kind of political conflicts uh, going on, I think, and this provides one of my favourites. Quakers across the country were investing in similar water schemes um, because it was a good thing to do. How can you do better than bringing clean, healthy water and saving people from terrible dung water? Um, it's a good, good thing to do. Um, but um, back in the 1850s, the country was perhaps more advanced than it is today, and it realised that water supply should not be in the hands of a private company. It should be a, a state-run thing. And so, in 1854, the Darlington Board of Health, Darlington's first vaguely democratic council, agreed to take the, uh, the water supply from the pub private company into public ownership. The Board of Health was chaired by Joseph Pease, and it included his two brothers, Henry and John. So, the Board of Health agreed to buy the water company for £54,000, which was twice what the Pease's had invested in it just five years earlier. So, the Pease's voted to use public money to buy the company that was wholly owned by the Pease's. They were accused of unbridled profiteering, and the Northern Daily Express said with incredulity, the gentlemen who were acting for the ratepayers were precisely the same gentlemen who were bargaining for themselves. 
So, were they the good guys in bringing this clean water to the masses and saving lives, or were they the bad guys for lining their own pockets with ratepayers' money? I think it's just fascinating, these dilemmas that we can survive by studying history. So all of that fabulous controversy uh, unfolded within five years of Henry Pease taking that spade and turning the first sod exactly 175 years ago. And it's all part of that really rich story that makes Darlington unique. Um, and as indeed does this wonderful building that you keep alive, that is full of wonderful technology that I know nothing about, which is why I'm not going to talk about the technology. I can't even get my own printer at home to work, hence I'm reading my talk off a phone thing here. So I'm not going to tell you about the technology, although I love that kind of subterranean rhythmic rumble that you get over that way and that percussive blast from uh, that building over there. It's exciting stuff, even though I don't understand what it does. And I love the way the beam engine nods noiselessly back and forwards from way overhead to deep down below. It's kind of magical, uh, even if I don't under understand a single bit of it. So I'll just finish with what I do know, which is a quote from a newspaper about that moment, 175 years and two days ago precisely, uh, when Mr Pease plunged his shovel into the ground. The Shields Gazette up in Newcastle um, said he was enthusiastically greeted by a round of hearty cheers. And then it said, let us hope that there is a good time coming for Darlington. If cleanliness be next to godliness, then we may expect a decided improvement in the morals of our townspeople after these works are completed and a supply of pure and limpid water is within easy reach of all. So, congratulations on your 175th anniversary and thank you for doing all you thank you for all you're doing in still making sure that Darlington is kept close to cleanliness and godliness. <laughs> Right, I think that sort of concludes our our discussions. Our, yeah, that con concludes our uh, presentations. So, I just like you all to accept a piece of cake made by our ladies here, bottle of French bubbly or a soft drink. Uh, all the buildings are open, so if you want to have a walk around and see anything, please, please do. And I'd also like you to in like to invite you up to the the Baydale Beck from about half past 12 or quarter past 12. We have a cold buffet uh, lined up for us there. So, so thank you to Cliff and to Steve and to all of you for coming. I'd like to say I'd like to look forward to another 25 years time, but uh, we have a joke that in 25 years time, the site will be full of so many memorial benches. <laughs> There won't be room for anything like this. So thank you for coming and enjoy the rest of the day. Cheers. Cheers.